Grace, mercy, and peace to each of you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, and good morning. Good morning. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church on this second Sunday of Advent. It's great to see everybody. If you're visiting with us today, please let us know. There's a little uh, clipboard on the end of the pew. You can pass that around and put your name and a little information there. We would love to know that you were with us today. I have a bunch of announcements, so get ready. We will hold a congregational meeting next Sunday after worship for the purpose of electing elders for the class of 2025. So we're encouraging all of our members to be here and participate. Next Sunday, a group of us will go and do some Christmas caroling to our shut-ins. All abilities and voices are welcome. We provide the music. It's really easy. See Elliot Mitchell or Laura if you would like to go. Anything you would like to add to that, Elliot? You don't even have to sing. If you'd just like to kind of come and smile and and offer some uh, some some. Uh, you can you can lip sync. You yeah, can move yeah. your mouth. And I mean, it's it. it's about just coming and seeing these folks who don't get out and to kind of bring them some Christmas cheer into their lives for sure. Thank you. Uh, next week is also the annual Spring Hill Christmas Parade, a long-standing tradition here at church. Yes, ma'am, please. Um, we are doing the chili and the stuff, and so we do need a, you know, need donations for homemade chili, hot pot, preferably. Um, we also need to, if you found that it's easier for me just to go to Sam's Club and buy the cheese and everything, so if anybody wants to make a donation, please see me after service. And we need some gentlemen to help spread some holiday cheer and park cars for people who don't always have holiday cheer. Right. So the combination there is the critical part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we got one back there with his hand in the air. You can always get solid color. Yeah. I, I just need help with people parking cars. Great. I'll tell you what you got to do. All you got to do is stand there and sometimes you get a few sometimes. If, if you've not been before, it's a great opportunity. We reach out to the community with some chili and some goodies, and it's a great place to watch the parade from. Obviously, it goes right in front of the church. And so we would love to have you. You do need to remember that roads close about 4 o'clock, so if you're coming, you need to kind of be here a little bit early to find a place to park. And we do need a couple people to help us serve, so we can even start serving between 3.30 to 4, because by the time the parade starts, we're usually having enough. And nobody wants to walk. See Sissy for more information on that. There's still time to make a giving plan or pledge if you have not done that yet. We are our session meeting is next week, and the session would love to finalize our budget and have a plan for going into 2023. So if you've not been able to do that yet, we would ask one more time that maybe you get that to our treasurer, Bill Russell, who's sitting over here. <coughs> Check the newsletter for other upcoming events. There's information in there about a blood drive and youth activities and the Comey and other ways to help our neighbors, lots of stuff in there. And if you don't get the weekly newsletter, there's a QR code in the bulletin. You can scan it, and it's real simple. Put your information in there, and you can get it. It comes out every Thursday at 3 o'clock. Any other announcements that I missed? Prayer concerns? Continue to pray for Ruth Cantrell. Ruby Heatley is at Williamson Medical Center. Angela Lackey and Ricky is in the back, but we're keeping him in our prayers. Are there others that we should add to our prayers today? Yes. My daughter Vicki fell on the ice and, and shattered her left wrist. Oh, no. And it's, she's about to retire in about six months or so after that. Cancer is pretty bad. Wow. Right Where was the ice? <coughs> Where does she live? Wyoming. In Wyoming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they would have ice in Wyoming. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? I did. So thank you. All right. Let us worship Almighty God together.
Jesus Christ is our hope. Christ is our hope for peace. We light this candle as a sign of the coming light of Christ, Advent and its coming. We are preparing ourselves for the days when the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the lion and the sapling together, and little child shall be there. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for your gift of Jesus to the whole world. As the shepherd found Jesus in the manger, may we find Jesus in your love and joy and spirit together. Help us, O oh God, to love one another. Help us to do our share to bring happiness, goodness, and peace to the world. Amen. Let us stand and join together the altar. Lord, give us peace. Our hope is in the Lord. For this time on and forevermore. What do we hope for? We hope for peace at such a time as this. Who is our God? Our God is the God of peace. Let us worship his holy name. How do we know this is God's time? There is a time for everything. Even in such a time as this? Whatever God does endures forever. Come, let us watch to God together. Our hymn of praise is number nine. <laughs> Filled with joy and the peace of believing, 
we will sing you our praises and serve you with our whole being to the end that affirms your glory. churches in Franklin that belong to an organization called Room in the Inn. It's a takeoff on the fact that when Jesus and his when Jesus' mother and daddy went to Bethlehem, they couldn't find room in the inn. So the, the, the hotel keeper said, I'm sorry I don't have any room in my inn. You can sleep in the barn in the back of the hotel. So this organization is called Room in the Inn. And I'm happy to say that the Historic Franklin Presbyterian Church and the First Presbyterian Church of Franklin are part of this group. And when the temperature gets down to a certain level, they open their doors and people who don't have a place to sleep inside, they can come in these churches and sleep. And they feed them a supper and they feed them the night that they get there and they feed them a breakfast before they leave. But there are churches that are helping out with people who don't have, so they don't have to sleep on the grass when it gets too cold. Okay. Now, so that's one reason you can say thank you, Jesus, is that you have a bedroom to sleep in rather than sleeping out on the grass or under a bridge someplace. Now, in your bedroom, do you have a bed to sleep in or do you have to sleep on the floor? On the floor in a, in a bed, in a bed, in a bed, in a bed. Okay, well, you know, there are some people that have, might have an apartment to sleep in. <coughs> But the kids don't have a bed to sleep in. They sleep on the floor. And yesterday, I happened to go to the Lowe's store in Franklin. And under the canopy at the uh, contractor's entrance, there were about 15 people who had workbenches set up. And they were cutting wood and they were making things. I walked over and I asked them what was going on. And they belonged to a group called Sleep in Heavenly Peace. They were volunteers who were making wood frames for bunk beds for kids to sleep in. And so there was another group of people. So you can say, thank you, but I've got a bed to sleep in. Thank you, Jesus, I've got a bed, right? So that, that's two thank you, Jesus, so far. Now, did you do you have your own bed in your own bedroom, or do you have to share your bedroom with your brother or sister? you have your own room? 
Do you have your own room? Okay, well, let me tell you. Maybe that's another thank you, Jesus, okay? Because when I was your age, I lived in a house that my great-grandfather had built in 1905. And it had three bedrooms, okay? And it, by the time I was there, it had a bathroom, too, indoors, not an outhouse like my grandma had. But my grandma and grandpa lived with us. So my grandma and grandpa needed one of these bedrooms. My mom and dad needed one of these bedrooms. So my brother and I had to share a bedroom, okay? And it was the smallest of the three bedrooms that we shared. So there wasn't enough space in this bedroom for two twin beds. So we had, and there wasn't even enough space for a standard bed. We, we had what was called a junior bed. It was about one and a half twin beds, which was okay when we were little. But by the time we got into high school, see, my brother's two years younger than me, so we were in high school at the same time. The bed was getting kind of crowded. And my brother did not like my foot or my hand or anything on his side of the bed. And he was always fussy about that. So sometimes when I would get in bed, I would kind of sneak my hand under his pillow. Not <coughs> that much under his pillow to say I was on his side of the bed. And I don't know how he knew this, but he could tell. He would say, Mom, Bruce is on my side of the bed again. And my mother would come in. And she would draw an action down the bed, and she said, yeah, you stay on this side, you stay on this side. I don't want to hear another peep out of you for the rest of the night, because your daddy has to get up early to go to bed in the morning. So if you have your own bed, that's number three, Jake. Thank you, Jesus, okay? You're lucky to have your own bed. I didn't have my own bed until I was 18 years old, and I went away to college. I didn't have my own, and even then I had a roommate, so I didn't even have my own bedroom. Till I was 21 and went into the Air Force. So you are really much more fortunate than me. Not that I have a bad life or anything like that, but you really lucky to have your own bed in your own bed. Now, when you get up in the morning, did you have clean clothes to put on? You probably had clothes in the closet, right? Well, some people only have one set of clothes they have to wear all the time. So that's number four, thank you, Jesus, for you, okay? Did you have breakfast this morning before you came to church? Yeah. Some people did. That could be your number five, thank you, Jesus. Are you going to have lunch after church today sometime with your mom and dad? Some people, and, and you probably have something else to eat tonight. So you'll probably have three meals today, right? Some people are lucky to have one, maybe two. So those are a whole bunch of thank you Jesuses that, that you are lucky to have. And, and every day you have these things, right? So I read, a, I read that there's some statistics that say if you do something every day for 20 days, it'll become a habit. You'll, you'll just do it automatically. So what I'd like you to do between now and Christmas, which is 20 days, I'd like you every night when you go to bed and you have a room to go in when you go into your bedroom say thank you jesus for this bedroom thank you jesus for this bed thank you jesus for the clothes i have thank you jesus for breakfast thank you jesus for lunch thank you jesus for supper will you do that for me and if you do that for 20 days and everybody should be doing this okay he said if you do this for 20 days it'll become a habit you'll be thankful for so many things in your life that you wouldn't even, even imagine. So let's let's agree to do that, okay? Now let's say a prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for these young minds here today that are listening and are going to be thankful for just the smallest things that they might seem small at the time, but there are other people who don't have these things, and so it's worthwhile being thankful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming on. I've got two more. One, thank you, Jesus, for allowing us to have children in our church. Lots of churches don't have that. And the second one is thank you for adults like Bruce who want to teach the faith to the next generation. Would you stand and let us join together our voices in hymn number four? Please stand. <laughs>
Would you join me as we pray for illumination? Let's pray. For God, it's the season of, of light. We light the Advent candles and it reminds us of your ever presence with us. Your Holy Spirit descends upon us not only in this season, but in every moment of our lives. We are grateful. We thank you for being with us today in our word. We pray that as we read it together and reflect, that you would teach us what we need to know. We make our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Our responsive reading is from the fifth chapter of Matthew, verses 13 through 16. Would you read it with me? Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but it is brought out and trampled under good. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one has the light of the lamp and puts it under the bushel basket, but on the last stand, it gives light to all the mass. In the same way, let your light shine before others. Friends, today we're in the book of Esther. We're in the fourth chapter. I'll be reading verses 1 through 17. Listen for God's word to you this day. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went through the city wailing with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. In every province, wherever the king's command and his decrees came, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and most of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's maids and her eunuchs came and told her the queen was deeply distressed, she sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth but he would not accept them. Then Esther called for Hathach, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what had happened and why. Hathach went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of all the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show it to Esther, explain it to her, and charge her to go to the king to make supplication to him and entreat him for her people. Hathak went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hathak and gave him a message from Mordecai, saying, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner courts without being called... There is but one law. All alike are to be put to death. Only if the king holds out the golden scepter to someone, may the person live. I myself have not been called to come to the king for thirty days. When they told Mordecai that what Esther had said, Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silence at such a time as this, Relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another corner. But you and your father's family will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. Then Esther said in reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf and neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will also fast as you do. After that I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. This is the word of the Lord. So the preacher had delivered what he thought was a great sermon, and he was really feeling good on the way home. How many great preachers do you think there were preaching today, he asked his wife. And she said, one less than you think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
So, I have another great story for you today. It's another great story of kings and queens, treachery and romance, corruption and power, all the goodies. You've already had a glimpse of the story from what we just read, but yet I wonder how many of you know a whole lot about the story of Esther. I can't even think of anybody in our congregation named Esther. Do we have anybody named Esther? Not that I can think of. So I'm going to try to tell you the story. All the while knowing that I, I can't really do it justice. You should really read it yourself. You, you can pull it up on your smartphone, your favorite Bible app, and have like Alistair MacLean read it to you in a perfect British accent or something. Better yet, we could ask my friends at the temple up in Nashville, Rabbi Shifton and Rabbi Macklin, to read it to us. It's just as important to them and the Jewish people as it is to us. The truth is, the story of Esther has been controversial for both Christian and Jews alike throughout history. Martin Luther once said that he wished the story of Esther had never been written down. There's no mention of God in the story, no prayers, no worship. There's nothing at all that would identify it as a story of faith, at least not directly. Instead, there are parts of it that make us uncomfortable and demonstrate how things in the ancient world were sometimes misogynistic, brutal, and even discriminatory. At the end of the story, the Hebrew people take their revenge on the people that had oppressed them, not the ending that we would expect to see. So it's a strange story. But I want to suggest to you this morning that the story of Esther is an important story for us, especially living at such a time as this. It's the story of how a woman of no power and no privilege, a woman who is not the paragon of virtue herself, rises to a position of authority amongst the highest levels. She then uses her advantage to advocate for the weak and the oppressed. It's the story about the inherent worth of all people. So let me tell you the story again. The Jews of the ancient world became people of the diaspora, meaning that they were living in small pockets in virtually every nation. There was a diaspora in Babylon, Babylonians themselves had conquered. The Persians also had a diaspora under the great ruler Xerxes, who had come and conquered them. If you've not seen the 300 movies, which are really violent, I don't suggest you see them. But that's the Xerxes in that movie. The Israelites find themselves living in the diaspora under a powerful and dominating foreign king. And that's where the book of Esther starts. In the Bible, though, Xerxes has a different name, different translations, and so in the Bible it's King Ahasuerus. It's the name that is used when describing Xerxes, the king of the Persians. The Persian Empire was massive, all the way to India, up into Europe. The beginning of Esther, King Ahasuerus throws the greatest of all the ancient festivals. It's a party unlike the world had ever seen, celebrating his vast and powerful empire, 180 days in all, the party would demonstrate the extravagance and wealth of the king. On the third day, it says, when Ahasuerus was filled with wine, he is goaded into calling for his wife, Queen Vashti, so that all the guests of the party could look at her, for she was lovely to look at, it says. Ahasuerus wanted to show off his trophy wife. But a crisis arises when Vashti refuses to come. Perhaps the first act of feminism in the ancient world, Vashti refuses to be put on display even for the great king Ahasuerus. So the king flies into a rage and simply removes her from being the queen. Through his officials then, he has all the women of his harem brought to him, and one by one he considers them for the role of the new queen. We're going to skip through the details of this part of the story to keep it a family show this morning. This is where the king meets Esther, who we've been introduced to the story earlier. Esther was one of the Jews living in the city of Susa as part of the diaspora. The story tells us that she is an orphan. Both her parents have died, and that she's being raised by her uncle Mordecai. In almost every way we can imagine, she is the perfect image of the diaspora. She is a child without roots, in the same way the people of God are living a place without a home or a heritage. Because Esther too was 
lovely to look upon, says the story, King Ahasuerus eventually chooses her to be the new queen. At this point, Mordecai has warned Esther to keep her lineage and her heritage as a Jew a secret. And it is unknown to the king and the officials. The king in the story is almost a stooge. He is easily manipulated by almost everyone. Esther's uncle Mordecai overhears a plot to kill hatched by two of his attendants. He tells Esther, who in turn tells the king, and the plot is foiled. The two attendants are hanged on the gallows of Susa. We learn from this incident that violence is what you should expect if you cross the king. Then we meet another high official of the king's court, a man named Haman. Haman is very impressed with himself, and he demands that all the people of the kingdom bow down to him whenever he is in their presence. It was an order from the king to honor Haman. Again, the king is so easily manipulated. But Mordecai, the uncle of Esther, refuses and Haman is thrown into a rage. He vows to take his revenge on Mordecai for his disrespect, but not only will he destroy Mordecai, he convinces the king to command that all of Mordecai's people, all of the Jews, be killed, wherever they are, living throughout the Persian Empire. Haman wants to wipe off the planet any hint of the diaspora, and that becomes the order given. So there is great stress, weeping, and gnashing of teeth that come upon every Jew with such an order. That's why Mordecai himself is in sackcloth and ashes. And so in our story, we read, Esther learns what has taken place, calls for Mordecai, and this is where we see the heart of the story. Mordecai tells her she must go to the king on behalf of her people and advocate for them. Well, as you might imagine, at first Esther wants no part of it, she doesn't want to go to the king. It's risky because she knows that the king might kill even her. She knows very well what happens to those that oppose the violent king. Still, as we read together, Esther is faithful to her uncle and her people, and she goes to the king saying, If I perish, I perish. Even though she did not want to do it, Esther knows that she has been chosen for such a time as this. She's the only one that can save the Jews, and so she does. So Esther holds a banquet for Ahasuerus and Haman, convinces the king to lift his order to kill the Jews, and instead reverses the order and gives the order that the Jews themselves might take their revenge on any that harm them. This is the troublesome part of the story. But all is well again. The story of Mordecai and Haman, though, is not yet finished. One night the king has trouble sleeping and has brought the record of his kingdom. He reads about the way Mordecai saved his life from the attendants back earlier in the story. And he remembers Mordecai with great favor. And so he asks, what has been done to honor Mordecai for his faithfulness? Nothing, sire, is the answer he gets. So the king calls in Haman. What would we do for someone who has been faithful in such an important way? And Haman thinks that the king is talking about him. So he says... We would place the royal robes on him, and put him on the royal pony, and parade him throughout the kingdom for all to see. Haman is vain. And so an incredible turn of events toward the end of the story, this is what is done for Mordecai. And Haman himself is forced to lead Mordecai throughout the streets of Susa to the honor that he himself wanted to have. As you can imagine, Haman is infuriated and has gallows built to hang Mordecai, but Queen Esther again intervenes. She goes to the king. She convinces Ahasuerus that Haman is the betrayer, that Mordecai is faithful, and in the final insult, Haman is hanged on the very gallows that he built for Mordecai. What a great story. <laughs> By the end, we see that Esther was the person appointed for such a time as her people found themselves in peril and threat of disappearing forever. God sent a faithful servant. Esther saved not only Mordecai, who had been so faithful to her, but all of the Jewish people living scattered across the ancient world, an orphaned Jewish woman with such power against such a violent and corrupt king. As one commentator said, the Assyrian Empire is no more, the Babylonian Empire is no more, the Persian Empire is no more, even the Roman Empire is no more, but the Jewish diaspora continues even today. God has preserved a remnant of God's people. 
As Christians, we are grafted on to that very root of Judaism. Remember, we read months ago in the narrative lectionary that God promised God's people would remain a blessing for all of creation. They were blessed in order to be a blessing. In the story of Esther, it looks as if that promise would be swept away by the power of wealth and corruption. But God is working. We don't see it overtly in worship or prayer or under the name of God in the story, but God is still there. And so my question for you today in light of such a story is, do you believe that? Do you believe that the Spirit of God is always working, always transforming, always creating, shaping the world around us into the image that God would have? I wonder sometimes if we don't miss stories all around us because just like Esther, they're not overtly religious, filled with prayers and worship, the naming of God. But stories of God's action in the world around us are not such because we name them. Instead, God can act without our knowledge and certainly without our permission or naming. Sometimes we can't even perceive that God is working around us until much later when we see in the rearview mirror what was not clear when we were in the heart of it. And that's actually what the word predestination means. You know that a term that Presbyterians often get saddled with? Oh, those are those Presbyterians. They believe in predestination. Do you know how many Presbyterians it takes to screw in a light bulb? None. If the light was predestined to be there, it'll be there. <laughs> but I think what Calvin was really trying to say in the doctrine of predestination is that God is always working towards the ends that God intends. For, for one, I'm grateful that I don't always know what God is doing. I would, it would likely overwhelm us. In the words of the great theologian Jimmy Buffett, where it all ends, I can't fathom my friends. If I knew, I might toss out my anchor. Esther is good news for us because it encourages us to seek out the stories of God in places where we might not think to look. In places that don't seem religious. In places where people are not asked to pray or to worship. In places where God is not named, but God is clearly present. Maybe those are the places where we're most comfortable anyway. So much of religion today seems so, so performative, so shallow. It's almost like people are whistling in the darkness of their despair. They're, they're putting on a good face for others when it comes to the practice of their faith. But all the while, they're terrified and hopeless. It seems like the essence of our age sometimes. So I say let the story of Esther be a sort of Ebenezer of trust. A beacon or a marker that is laid down that declares that even when it doesn't appear to everyone or even anyone that God is there, God is still there working out our salvation. There's never a time in our lives when we can look around and discover that God is not with us. In just a moment, friends, we're going to gather around the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. This table in front of me is the table of the powerless and the powerful. It's the table for those that enjoy privilege and those without stature. It's the table where all are welcome, no matter their color, nationality, gender, sexual preference, or political position. It's the table of reconciliation, where each person is invited just as fully as any other, and where each of us gets to experience the full incarnational presence of Jesus Christ in the world. This table might be the opposite of Esther, the other end. Sometimes we understand things even more when we see their opposite. If Esther is the place where God's transformation is hidden and obscure, then this table, like our baptism, is the place where we can see transformation happen again and again. Esther said, if I perish, I perish. The Lord Jesus said at this table, this is my body which is broken for you. Our absolute trust in God to work out our salvation is both seen and unseen, known and unknown, a part of every part of our lives, and sometimes known only to God. All we can say, as we said to the children, is thank you, Jesus. We are grateful, Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let us continue to worship now as we bring forth our tithes and our offerings. of the gifts you've given and ask that you use these gifts to bless others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you be seated? My friends, as I said, this is the Lord's table and all are welcome here. People will come from north and south and east and west and gather together at that table in the kingdom of God. Scripture tells us that when the risen Jesus was with his disciples, he broke bread and gave it to them and their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This table belongs to all those who recognize Jesus as the Lord of their life. If you've made such a profession, you're not just welcome at this table, but encouraged to participate with us as we share the elements. Listen to the words of institution as we have them from the Apostle Paul. That on the night our Lord was betrayed, he took bread, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sin. Take it and drink from it, and when you do, remember me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the, the birth, the death, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ until he comes again. You join me in the great prayer of thanksgiving. Let us pray. Holy God, we praise you. Let the heavens be joyful and let the earth be glad. We bless you at all times for creating the whole world for the promises to your people Israel and for Jesus Christ, in whom your fullness dwells. He was born of Mary, and so he shares our life. He ate with sinners, and so he welcomes us. Guiding his children, he leads us. Visiting the sick, Jesus heals us. Dying on the cross, he saves us. And risen from the dead, Jesus gives us new life. Living with you even now, he prays for us. With thanksgiving, we take this bread and this cup and proclaim the death and the resurrection of our Lord. Receive this, our sacrifice of praise. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, that this meal may be a communion in the body and blood of our Lord. God, make us one with Christ, with all who share this feast. Unite us in faith, 
Encourage us with hope, inspire us to love, that we may serve as your faithful disciples until we feast at your table in glory. We praise you, eternal God, through Christ your word made flesh, in the holy and life-giving spirit, now and forever. Amen. And now, with confidence as the children of God, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory of the right. Amen. Our meal is prepared. Let us celebrate together. Friends, this is the evidence of the transforming power of God. This is the bread of life.
when we stumble and fall, and we will, this is the evidence that we can be forgiven through the mercy of our God and Lord Jesus Christ and return to this table again and again. This is the cup of salvation. Let's pray together. God, we give you thanks for your presence in every moment of our lives. Sometimes we are very aware that you are with us, we're very aware of who you are to us, and other times we're not. You're there in the background, working things out for our salvation, for our lives. We're grateful for every moment. Thank you for feeding us again with the bread of life and the cup of salvation. Send us from this place in these next moments that we might share that joy and peace and hope of this season with others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn today is number 36. Would you stand and sing together? <laughs> Friends, don't forget about the Christmas parade next week and caroling next Sunday to see those folks that we talked about earlier if you want to participate. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord always look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.